There we go. Okay, uh, good morning everybody, and I want to uh, I want to uh, thank particularly the, the Hamfest committee and our division, uh, your division leadership, for inviting me out. Um, I, I can't say enough of uh, how uh, how amazing this this Hamfest is. The venue is amazing. The folks I've, I've had a chance to meet this weekend have been amazing. Um, uh, to the Hamfest committee, I think the success of this event is uh, truly a sign of the the, uh, the great work that you've done and all the hard work you've put in. It's it's been a, a fantastic event. Um, when I was getting ready to uh, kind of uh, figure out what this presentation was going to be on, I was asked one question. How long are you going to talk? <laughs> the answer to that is, as long as my wife lets me. <laughs> she could not make the trip, so I got some catching up to do. <laughs> so, a um, little bit about me, I, uh, and uh, what was said in the, uh, in, in the introduction, uh, most of that's true. Um, <laughs> I've been an active ham since day one. My very first contact in December 1988, and if anybody was active on, on HF in, in around 88, 89, 10 meters was wide open. My first contact was with J73LC in Dominica. So the DX bug bit really early. And that guy still has not sent me a QSL card. <laughs> I gotta go to Dominica. Um, but ever since then, I've been fascinated by amateur radio as a, as a whole. We've got a, uh, whether you want to call it a hobby, a service, a resource, whatever you want to call it, and to me they're interchangeable because there's aspects to, uh, to each of those in what we do. It is absolutely fascinating because of its diversity. It, it is, to this day, 20, almost 25 years after I was first licensed, it still amazes me with five watts I can talk around the world on HF. Or standing out in a parking lot and I can tell some stories about some satellite operations, which I, I've got to share one, because it's worth it. I've got, a, I've got a theory that the, the three ham radio events that will give you the best war stories are field day, ham fests, and portable satellite operating. I was in Key West, Florida about a year ago I happened to be there the day that the Navy was commissioning a brand new destroyer, the USS Spruance. Well, I got to see the commissioning ceremony. Later that day, I wanted to do a satellite pass, AO 51 pass. So there's this really nice parking lot between Mallory Square and the Navy base. So I'm set up in this parking lot about a thousand feet from the Spruance. Here I am, waving this aero antenna around, looking for the satellite. And predictably, shore patrol came by. <laughs> and you can pretty much guess what their first question was. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> and I explained, fortunately the guy knew what ham radio was, he understood what I was doing, and he says, I've got one favor to ask. Just don't point the antenna at the spruits. I said, in all fairness, they got a 20 millimeter gun pointed at me. We know who's going to win this argument. <laughs> so with that, let's get into the presentation. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to do is give a little background on what the emergency preparedness program is. Um, the, the three stooges here are the ones that uh, uh, kind of handle the uh, emergency preparedness program. Uh, myself, Ken Bailey, K1FUG, the Emergency Preparedness Assistant, who, is, uh, who came on board about a year and a half ago. Ken is our Swiss Army knife around there. This guy's background is in education, law enforcement, and IT. So, yeah, we're, 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 he's, he's been a great resource at, at headquarters. And many of you may know Steve Ewald, uh, the field, uh, field su uh, support staff supervisor. Steve is, without a doubt, one of the greatest resources of institutional knowledge at League Headquarters. He's been there about 29 years and has worked with the field organization almost all those 29 years. Um, a great resource uh, for, for the field organization there at Headquarters. So, what does the Emergency Preparedness Program do? Here's the short list, well, as we go through. Started in 2007. There's been one other person in this position before me, but it's a fairly recent position. And it was created because of the increase in amateur radio activity in the public service uh, communications area. 
currently has a staff of two dedicated to emergency preparedness, myself and Ken. Steve is kind of in a, a separate area, but we work together as a team. And that's the short list of our areas of responsibility. Um, and then, of course, as everybody knows, there's that one other item that I left off here, and other duties as assigned. <laughs> So going through some of these, we, we work with the education department. Um, we do a lot of work with national partners. I probably spend a, as much time or more on the road meeting with served agencies at a, at a national level as I do going to Hamfest. Um, we keep a we keep a constant and, and improving relationship with our national level partners. And this is kind of the short list of who these who these folks are. National Public Safety Telecommunications Council. It's one of those you, you, you're not going to hear a lot of. This is representatives from about 15 of the largest public safety communications organizations. Organizations are members of this group, not individuals. Um, the ARRL has been very fortunate in that we have been put on the governing board of NIPSTIC. This is our chance when, when we need the support of the public safety community, we've got a venue we can go to them. Most recently, HR 607, which was an issue uh, about a year ago or so, uh, that threatened the 440 band, 70 centimeter band. Um, Nipstick came out in our favor and sent a letter of support uh, that said they, they support the league's opposition to HR 607. Now, the rest of HR 607, which I should say, the league and Nipstick support the, the idea of HR 607, which was to create, to give uh, public safety the D block. Both of us disagreed with the idea of auctioning off the 70 centimeter band, and that fight was, was very fortunately won. Um, APCO, the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, you know, one of the neat things about APCO is if you attend their conference, one of the things they ask you at registration is, what's your amateur radio call sign? There's a lot of hams that are members of APCO, and it's, it's a great resource for networking. National Weather Service, this is probably the best relationship amateur radio has had with a served agency in the history of amateur radio for a couple reasons. One is very clearly defined role in what we do. We support their Skywarn program, and we support the storm spotting efforts that they do, the volunteer storm spotting efforts that we do, and as we've increased our our technological capacity, we're also adding to things like the uh, the CWAP program, the Citizens Weather Observation Program. So we're really providing a, a tremendous amount of uh, information and, and uh, a tremendous resource to the National Weather Service. And the other side, the other um, great thing about the relationship with the National Weather Service, and without a doubt, the most important part of the relationship is mutual respect. This is something we often overlook when we work with a served agency. We tend to go in like we're looking for a job, and then we become subservient to the served agency. National Weather Service has a very a very strong opinion on this is the amateur radio service stands alone, the National Weather Service stands alone, this is a partnership. There isn't this subservient attitude and that is that has really been what has defined that relationship for almost 40 years. Something new we're, we're working with, we've been doing a lot of work with the International Association of Emergency Managers. This is a new project that we've taken on. Uh, we we uh, did a presentation at their conference last year in Las Vegas. We did a uh, forum on amateur radio and I was surprised to see close to 200 people in attendance. Um, this has been a tremendous resource for us, but um, like any organization, uh, leadership changes right now. We're kind of keeping our distance. The, they've got some leadership issues as far as I can see that, it, that seem to be going on. But even when that happens, we keep, uh, we keep in touch, we keep maintaining that relationship. National VOAD. This is one of the best kept secrets for amateur radio operators, right here. This actually fits better to what we do, and I'm, I'm going to get into a little bit here in a little bit, is what is it we really do? National VOAD, which VOAD is Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters, at the national level there are 53 member organizations, folks like the Red Cross, um, LDS Disaster Services, Presbyterian Disaster Services, um, some corporate partners that have associate memberships. Twice a year we meet and 53 organizations sit around the table and share ideas. And this also exists at the state level in state VOADs. This is really a gold mine for amateur radio. 
The one thing that came out of this year's national meeting uh, for National VOAD was we need amateur radio involved with the state VOAD. Every state VOAD president that I talked to said, how can I get the amateur radio operators at the table with us? This is your chance to have served agencies sitting around and begging for help in some cases. During uh, the tornadoes in Indiana and Kentucky, several of them came to me and said, you know, we now realize why we need amateur radio in, in part of our response plans. And these are groups that you may have never heard of before. The, one that, the first one to come to me was Nakama, which is a Jewish disaster services. We never think of, of, of reaching out to some of these organizations that are, are very willing and very glad to, to take our help. Of course, one of the biggest partnerships we got, American Red Cross. Um, that has been greatly improved since the debacle with the uh, background check issue a few years ago. Um, that, uh, and that it still kind of creeps up as a, as a bit of a sore spot, but the, the relationship the League has had with the American Red Cross has been steadily improving, and what's really helped is the, the manager at uh, Red Cross headquarters in Washington, manager of disaster services technology, is a ham. And that, is, that has been a, a big plus. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, particularly FEMA and the Citizen Corps program, and the Office of Emergency Communications. We, we work a lot with them. And of course the National Hurricane Center is a, a, is a huge partner for the League. So going down the list, uh, some of the other things we do, advice and guidance to the field organization, um, mostly through, through Steve's work. MOU compliance, this has always been an issue that comes up occasionally. At the local level, local EC's got the ability to create an MOU with a served agency. But sometimes you need to get that extra set of eyes on it, a little bit of guidance, maybe clear up some language, maybe uh, include something you didn't think of. We do that. We occasionally we'll get an MOU sent to us and we'll run it through the, the process and, and review it and, and make sure everything is okay with it. Uh, Handmade program. This is a program started uh, during Hurricane Katrina where equipment manufacturers made large donations of equipment to support the response efforts. Well, uh, seven years later and we still have the equipment. So what we're doing with it now is during major disasters. And it's got to be you know, multiple sections, maybe multiple divisions involved where local resources are being quickly depleted. We can provide amateur radio equipment. And nice thing is we've got an agreement with one of the airlines. We just take it out to uh, the airport uh, in Hartford, throw it on an airplane, they'll take it anywhere they fly for free. And this has been a, a huge help. Now, however, we, we did have one issue during Irene where a request came in from Vermont. This airline doesn't fly to Vermont. So uh, I loaded up three kits into my truck and drove through a hurricane impacted western Massachusetts into southern Vermont uh, and dropped this, uh, this equipment off at the Brattleboro Police Department. While I was there, I got to meet with their 911 operators. And I spent 10 years in a 911 center, and, and including during Katrina. And these, these two ladies in the 911 center were, go, were just going, I can't believe how busy we are. <laughs> <laughs> Should have been in Biloxi. <laughs> um, <laughs> product reviews, another big, issue, uh, big area that we work with. Um, in fact, in September, we'll be, we're, uh, just did a review on a, uh, a portable antenna system from Comet. And there's something else, you know, there's a lot of products that are heavily used in, in public service communications. And this is something we keep an eye out for. And something that you typically don't hear of, and if you do hear of it, something bad is happening, is the ARRL, Headquarters Emergency Response Team. This is kind of how we work during a disaster. The team is, is comprised of some uh, staff members. We kind of go through the monitoring phase, an alert phase, activation, and response. So it's a, it's a, a staged process. It's composed of key headquarters staff. And the idea behind this response team is if a major disaster requires more out of headquarters than we can provide during normal business hours, we can activate this team and make things happen. Um, the, the activation process is based on information from the field. The decision is actually among, made at headquarters amongst staff, but it's supported through information coming in. And the, uh, the main areas of responsibility for this team is PR and media support for the field organization, conference call coordination, uh, regulatory guidance. That's something that sometimes we overlook the fact that 
even during a disaster, Part 97 still applies. You know, the idea that in an emergency, Part 97 is thrown out the window and anything happens. That's not true. First, we've got to remember what an emergency is. Life and death, imminent threat of, of uh, I'm sorry, imminent threat of, uh, to life or property. This doesn't mean a perceived threat, imminent threat. You know, the, the, the boat's sinking and you're, you know, you're on the top mast and you've only got about a foot before you hit water. That's an emergency. Um, handmade requests, those are made by section managers. They come into headquarters. And the reason it's done through the section managers is for a simple reason, we have to have some way to track accountability. We have to have one person that we, we know who they are, they're a known quantity, and we can say, all right, it's being sent to you. Now, what you do it from there, just make sure you throw out a chain of custody sort of thing, but you know, we can provide the uh, handmade uh, equipment to, to the sections. And something that's probably going to be coming down the pike before long, I think, is the Major Disaster Emergency Coordinator. This was an idea that came out of a report from a few years ago. And the idea behind this is, and probably the best example is uh, the uh, tornado that hit Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The, uh, the area impacted, directly affected the section manager, the assistant section manager, and, uh, and of course wiped out communications in the affected area. During times like that, or a major hurricane, we can, uh, we can appoint, um, and actually we, we would create a pool of folks that would fill this, a major disaster emergency coordinator, and their job is be that relay between what's happening in the field and headquarters. So that way, if I need to find out what's going on, I got one person I call, and they're keeping in touch with all the SMs and the SECs, um, and, and maybe like state EOCs to, to keep tabs of what's going on. A um, few other areas, publications. Uh, you know, we, we do have several publications dedicated to public service communications. In fact, we'll be coming out with a new, uh, it was called the Emergency Communications Handbook, but uh, the next one coming down uh, the road in, in probably in October is going to be called the Public Service Communications Handbook. And it's probably about two or three times the size of the current Emergency Communications Handbook. This is going to be a major, major uh, publication. Uh, situational awareness, that's something that we're, we're constantly doing uh, at headquarters. And of course this comes from primarily from the field organization. You know, that's, we've got to keep tabs of what hams are doing and only hams can tell us what they're doing. It also comes from national partners. During a major disaster, I'm usually on the phone with, uh, with the national VOAD folks uh, or in touch with folks at uh, FEMA and we're getting information from them as well. Sometimes this information may be funneled back out to the field organization if there's a, a specific request. Of course, media and social media. You know, this is the, the new buzzword in everything now. Um, we've got Twitter feeds, Facebook, uh, uh, YouTube uh, through headquarters. So we've got, uh, we're, we are uh, definitely involved with the social media. And uh, a couple other areas, website content, we have the public service portion of the website, and international emergency communications. Um, you know, we, we always have to keep in mind that we're the only ones with concepts of political boundary jurisdiction and things like that. A disaster has no concept of any of that. And typically, like during a hurricane, the first people I'm on the phone with are hams in the Caribbean and Central America. So. Now a few caveats, and this is, the, this is the juicy part of the presentation. What you're about to hear may not be NIMS compliant, and I make no apologies for that. <laughs> so a few caveats. Those that need to hear this are not here. <laughs> so guess what your job is? Take the message to the streets. You will likely hear something that will make you uncomfortable or challenge your perceptions, and that is a good thing. One thing about amateur radio is this is not a static hobby or a resource or a service. It is an always changing uh, hobby, service, or resource. Keep an open mind. And again, this probably isn't NIMS compliant. So, what is it we really do? What 
we all know this phrase, we've, we've heard it, we've got bumper stickers, we've got hats, t-shirts, magnets, and some of us even mutter it in our sleep. When all else fails. But what is all else? We typically think of when normal lines of communication are down or overloaded, the first things that come to mind are landline telephones, cellular phones perhaps, and uh, conventional radio networks. Those aren't normal anymore. Those are secondary means of communication. Internet is primary. Yes, it's infrastructure. Yes, we like to be infrastructure independent, but in reality we're not. If anything, hams as communicators. We are infrastructure utilizers. When it's there, we'll use it. When it's not, we're just fine. <coughs> So we have to really think about what is all else and what are we doing for that all else. How is this perceived by served agencies? I can tell you from the ones I've talked to, they don't like this saying. It's arrogant, it's offensive, and it makes what they're doing seem like it's weak and fragile. So what we have to do is we have to look at this. Is, is this our motto or is this a challenge to us? Right now, the way I see it, when all else fails is not what we say to served agencies, it's what we say to ourselves and ask ourselves, do we really live up to this? So is it time for an update? Do we need a new battle cry? Do we need a new saying to go to a served agency with? Perhaps. So. Following from that, we've all heard the term MCOM, we've all heard the term public service, some may have heard disaster communications, served agency communications, auxiliary communications, the list goes on and on. So is it MCOM versus public service, MCOM or public service, what is it we really do? The way I look at this is MCOM makes sense pretty much just to us, and if we really think about it, it may not be the right word for what we do. I was talking with a served agency one time, and I, I just let kind of slip the word MCOM. They went, what's that? <coughs> Emergency communications. I went, oh, I thought you meant M, like the letter M, which would be mobile communications. Okay, yeah, so MCOM's a little misleading. And I went, hams do emergency communications? <laughs> and I, I, had, I was taken aback for a second. I thought, well, yeah, you know, tornadoes, Hurricanes, fires, oh, no, emergency communications is in the 911 center. That's disaster communications, which sparked a very interesting conversation. This was with some VOAD folks. I said, why aren't you guys emphasizing disaster communications? You know what the difference is between a disaster and an emergency, right? An emergency happened to me, a disaster happened to you. <laughs> They said, you know, most of what you're doing falls into disaster communications. And the reason I'm giving these folks a lot of credit, VOAD folks, we're the only one really at that table where not 100% of our mission is disaster response. If you really think about it, maybe 5% of our mission is disaster response or public service or fill in the blank. But they did bring up a good point. I think back in 25 years of, of involvement with ARIES and other groups, only once did I have a life or death emergency, I mean an immediate life or death emergency on my hands where I was the first person on scene. It was a house fire. So thinking in, the, in those terms, do we really do emergency communications? We communicate emergencies, that's different. You know, anybody that's got the ability to communicate can communicate an emergency. But are we emergency communicators? Having spent 10 years in a 911 center, I can tell you I haven't met too many hams that I would trust answering a 911 call. <laughs> to say we're emergency communicators, especially when you're talking to somebody in a, that works in a 911 center or in another professional communications capacity, much like our motto, it can come across as a little arrogant and also a little, uh, uh, well, here's, a, here's an example. You're in the kitchen one day, you're making dinner, you have a grease fire. Take the flour, throw it on the fire. Fire's out. Are you now a firefighter? No. You wouldn't go bragging that you are. 
Um, emergency communications can have that same thing. We have to look at that when it, when it comes to how others perceive us. So let's take a look at what part 97 says that we do. We all know this. Well, we love to quote it. Problem is we also leave out all the rest of 97.1 when we tend to quote this section. But recognition and enhancement of the value of the amateur, amateur service to the public as a voluntary non-commercial communication service, particularly with respect to private, providing emergency communications. We, we know this by heart. It's got problems though. It was written in 1934. Yes, we did emergency communications in 1934. The communications infrastructure at that time was far different than it is now. So you may ask yourself, why is it still in there? Well, the simple answer is it would take an act of Congress to, to change 97.1 in the wording. So it's kind of been left as is. Um, and again, at that time we did, we, uh, we did emergency communications and the infrastructure has changed. So what is it we do? Now we've raised some questions here. Our motto may be misleading. MCOM may not be the right word. Disaster communications, maybe, but it doesn't fit everything we do. And we still got this public service communications thing lingering out there. But what do we do first? Before we do emergency communications, before public service, before anything else, we are amateur radio operators first. I am a firm believer. I don't like the only mindset. An only mindset tells me narrowness of mind and a lack of vision. I'm a DXer only. Great. But what is, what is that doing for the amateur radio service? You know, if there was an emergency, would a DXer only know what to do? At the same time, and I've heard this too many times, MCOM only. I only got my license for an emergency. Guess what? You're about as useful in an emergency as the DXer only. We are amateur radio operators. We have to, especially for what we do for our communities, for our, for our state, for our countries, we have to have a very broad, deep, and diverse knowledge of the amateur radio service. You don't get your driver's license thinking the next day you're going to go out and race the Indy 500. You've got to be able to master the skill of driving before you excel at it. For amateur radio operators, we have to master our skills in the amateur radio service before we take those skills and try to, to serve others. We are adaptable communicators with a diverse toolbox. One of the questions I always cringe when I hear, and I just got this last week, has the league officially endorsed a single digital mode for all emergency communications? Nope, not gonna happen. Why? A diverse toolbox. You have to have a diverse toolbox. This is not only your modes of communication. This is your skills as an operator. This is your license. You know, I just recently wrote an article for the Aries e-letter. Upgrade your license. Your license is one of those great communications tools that often gets overlooked. You need spectrum in your communications toolbox and upgrading your license gives you more spectrum. We have a broad understanding of the amateur radio service. I cannot emphasize this enough. You've got to know what the amateur radio service is capable of in every possible way to really be that, that tremendous value. You know, I mean, we can't all start right out of the gate and know everything. That's why we always have to keep learning. And this one I'm going to hit on especially. We've got to present a positive public image uh, to those that we serve. Um, and I'm going to really elaborate on that in a minute. So what is it we do? Bringing it all together, it's the 80, 19, and 1 rule. First and foremost, we are the amateur radio service. We are not subservient to a served agency. We are an FCC federally recognized radio service. We must remember that. We look for partnerships. We're not out looking for a job. The second area, public service communications. I don't care what you do, a parade, a bike-a-thon, a tornado, uh, a house fire, whatever it is, you can call it public service communications and that's accurate. You are in service to the public. You gotta remember, that's ultimately the customer, is the public. Even when you work with a served agency, yes, you're working with them, but the, the ultimate customer 
is the public. So within public service communications, we have three other areas. Community event communications, parades, bikeathons, etc. Disaster response communications, which makes up about 19% of what we do, and emergency communications. Again, imminent threat to life and property. And if you really think about it in those terms, true emergencies, and, and you know, a true emergency only exists less than 1% of the time anyway, so you can imagine in the entirety of what we do, that number may even be lower than 1%. So 8019-1, community event communications. This is our bread and butter. This is our shining moment. This is when we get to put on the good image, not only to served agencies, or maybe a community, a group. Uh, like uh, when I was in Mississippi, I often worked with the Diabetes Association during their annual run. It's also a chance to put on that good image to the average citizen. They're recruiting events. This is your chance for a member of, of your community to say, I like what they're doing, and there seems to be more to it than just talking on an HT. Image is critical. I cannot stress this enough. Image is critical in everything that we do, particularly in public service. It's an opportunity to include those that don't like to do emergencies. They're the guys that don't want to go through all the training. The, uh, uh, they don't want to sit in an EOC. This is your chance to include them as well. And it's a relationship builder. It's your chance to convey the positive things that we can do for a community or for a served agency. So we've got disaster communications. This is where you have communications emergencies, where the infrastructure has been compromised, where there's communication outages and we can help fill that gap. We can help with, provide VOAD support during this time. Again, we are a volunteer organization active in disasters. We can utilize our ARIES mat and the MDEC concepts. When it happens because of the work we did ahead of time, we don't go to a disaster without doing the prep work beforehand. We work with the served agencies, we build relationships. And remember, a served agency can also be another ARIES group. On the Gulf Coast particularly, when a hurricane hits, you're pulling in ARIES groups from maybe three, 400 miles away to assist with your communications. So look at other areas groups as also served agencies in a way. It can be personal or community, it can be local or out of area. You know, one of the first uh, major disasters I went to was for a hurricane that, was, that uh, hit the coast 300 miles from where I lived. So it could be that, at the same time it could be uh, another one that happened in my own, literally my own backyard, it was a century flood. So disasters can take on various uh, uh, various forms. And it does take a special skill set. You, you cannot go into a disaster without training and without experience. The last thing you want in a disaster, and this is one of the, uh, probably the best example I've ever heard, during the Tuscaloosa tornado, all the repeaters are wiped out. So they're setting up some temporary communications, and they found, they found that the best thing they could do was use the 440 band and provide simplex links between different sites. And uh, a, one of the uh, coordinators there got a phone call from one of the guys and said, well, okay, that's great. We, we've got a 440 radio, but we don't have a 440 antenna. He goes, well, build one. Your hams, build one. Well, how do you do that? You don't want a technical novice going to a disaster. You know, we have to remember that there are two components to what we do, operational and technical, and you've got to excel at both of those in a disaster. And then true emergency communications, imminent uh, life or property in imminent danger. There are no other means of communication available. Remember, we, we're not primary communications, and it's not done on a routine basis. Emergencies happen with little or no warning. Now, some disasters do as well, such as earthquakes. And we've got to understand what the difference is between communicating an emergency versus emergency communications. And we have to understand how to put that in the framework when we talk with served agencies. And we can get ourselves into a lot of trouble in this area. And the, the best example is, during the league forum the other day, the, uh, the subject of being a PIO came up. This is the ultimate landmine for amateur radio operators, whether it be an emergency, a disaster, or even a public service event. You've got your call sign on your hat, you've got a name badge on, you've got a yellow vest. When a reporter sees you, you know what the first word out of their mind is? Patsy. 
this is a ham, he likes to talk. And he probably doesn't know how, to, at least to a reporter. And you can be pumped for information very quickly. Everybody, every single person involved in public service communication should take a PIO course. And there's a reason for that. One of the findings that followed Hurricane Katrina was that PIOs during a major disaster will often get overloaded. The second best place to go for information, as far as the media is concerned, are communications people. Because they know what's going on. Whether you like it or not, they're going to approach you like a PIO. So you need to be on your toes and you can create as big of a disaster by being a bad PIO as you can from the, just from the disaster itself. So this is an area where we can get ourselves into a lot of trouble. Okay, so what do we need to do in these, in, in this, uh, with this 80 one scheme? A change in the amateur.